Hello, welcome to this CogSciSci curriculum soapbox session. Um, I'm Helen Skelton. I'm going to be talking to you today about electrolysis and thinking about some of the aspects of what makes electrolysis challenging to teach and perhaps how um, I go about it and ways that maybe would be useful for you to think about in um, your thinking about planning around and teaching electrolysis. Um, so um, I will just present my screen to you if I can work out how to do it and then we'll crack on with talking through um, the presentation that I've got for you. So um, just while I get this sorted, um, I'm going to be talking about quite a lot of things. Um, I'm really happy to engage in discussions on Twitter afterwards um, and I'd be really um, pleased to hear any thoughts, ideas, etc. that you have um, on this topic. Um, I think the most important thing really with curriculum is not for me to stand here and say this is what I think you should all be doing but it's to kind of get us thinking and discussing um, and I think that's what really um, helps us to um, plan better and think better and teach better when it comes to, to curriculum planning. Um, so Electrolysis then, why have I chosen this topic? So I've chosen to um, talk about electrolysis in this session because I think it's one of the topics which students find particularly challenging. Um, I think the reasons for that um, are really some of the things which make chemistry as a whole challenging. Um, and I'm gonna try and focus on some of those ideas this afternoon and kind of delve into them in a bit more detail. Um, so, I think really the key thing is the abstract nature of it um, and the fact that we're asking students to understand and describe and explain things which they can't really see um, at the level that we want them to understand. So they can't see the atoms um, and the ions and the electrons. Um, and really that's what we're trying to get them to visualise. Um, and I think that's really what makes chemistry challenging and what makes a topic like electrolysis challenging. And the other thing with electrolysis is it's underpinned by so much prior knowledge. Um, and I think that's another thing which can cause us um, to um, maybe trip up a bit with this topic where we're not explicit enough in um, revisiting and recapping some of that prior knowledge. So I just really am gonna talk through with you um, various aspects of the way that I've come to teach electrolysis um, over the years. So um, this is definitely not how I started off. Um, what I do has evolved a lot, some of it very recently. I'm going to mention um, things that various other people have um, talked about, which I've picked up ideas from and taken and applied into my own teaching. So there's not a lot this afternoon I'm going to say which is original, um, but hopefully it will give you some food for thought and um, will open up some discussion. So electrolysis then, I want to talk about five aspects of the subject of electrolysis. So first of all, I'm going to talk about um, firm foundations and the importance of that. Um, sequencing, ways of seeing, which I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on. Um, how we might actually teach in the classroom, so instruction and slop, and then a little bit about practical work and how I see practical work as fitting into this topic in particular. Um, so, um, without further ado, um, I will crack on and start with this idea of firm foundations. So, in any topic, in any teaching, we know that it's important that students have a secure prior knowledge and it's important that we know what they know before we start teaching. Um, and lots of people have, have talked about that um, in the past. And so, I think one of the key things I would say for any topic that I'm teaching um, it's really helpful to just sit down and have a think about the prior knowledge that students need to have before we start teaching it. Um, and the reason I think this is so important to think about explicitly um, is because then you can think about where it's best to put that prior knowledge in your teaching of the new topic. So I would normally just sit down and have a think about this. I wouldn't necessarily write it down normally. I've done so um, on this occasion just because I thought it would be helpful to share. Um, so I just sat down and jotted down really quickly some key bits of knowledge which I felt students would need to have in place before they can really understand elect um, electrolysis. So some ideas regarding electricity and electrostatics are important. The idea of ions and what um, a solution is or a melt is and the kind of uh, way that ions are going to be arranged in that melt and in that solution and how they're going to move and the properties of it and whether it's going to conduct or not. 
Um, at, when we're talking about the discharge at the electrodes, there's going to be things around uh, metallic bonding, covalent bonding, um, needing to know that a lot of the products of electrolysis are actually diatomic molecules that will um, influence what the half equations will be that students will need to be able to write. They're going to need to know a bit about atoms and ions and the electron structures of those to be able to draw those ideas together. Um, the reactivity series will be important. Knowing the states of elements at various different um, temperatures will be important. Um, the idea of oxidation and reduction, particularly in terms of electrons, is something that I think is a really crucial thing here because um, so often students are um, tied to the idea that oxidation is to do with gaining oxygen and in electrolysis that's not always the case it's um, very much a focus on the electrons and the electron movement um, and how that links to oxidation and reduction um, and so you can see here that there's some really key knowledge a lot of which is quite complex in itself which is important to the understanding of electrolysis. Some of that comes from physics, some of it comes from other chemistry topics, and it's important that when we are teaching this, we are aware of that, we make students aware of that, we check that knowledge, we recap that knowledge, and we give opportunities for practicing that knowledge. Um, another thing I've just thought that I've missed out on this diagram um, is the electrodes that we use are almost always made of graphite, and that's important because um, they look like a lump of carbon. Are our students going to re remember the details about the fact that those conduct electricity? Is that going to be something that's going to cause confusion and maybe get in the way of the understanding of electrolysis? So recapping um, the structure of graphite and the fact that it contains those free electrons which are required for the um, conductivity might be a really valuable thing to do. So um, I'm not going to spend a long time on this part of my talk. I just wanted to kind of highlight there the importance of firm foundations and the importance of thinking about prior knowledge so that you are ready and primed to um, bring that in to your teaching. Um, I would just say in this topic, um, one of the things I would get students to do right at the start of the topic is I would give them a copy of the reactivity series and I would make sure they are learning that and I would be testing them on that. Um, and I would also be encouraging them to learn the formulae for various atoms, uh, of various ions, um, so that they know the charges on them and on uh, particularly the transition metal ions and some of the compound ions, so the sulfate, the nitrate, etc. Um, because the more fluent they can be with those um, ion formulae, the easier it's going to be for them to uh, then think about the uh, other aspects of electrolysis and kind of put those uh, bits of knowledge to use in their thinking. Um, so lots of prime knowledge and it's always important that we think about that and we think about how we're going to check on those foundations and revisit and recap and tie them into our teaching. I definitely wouldn't say teach all this at the beginning, recap all this at the beginning, check all this at the beginning of the topic, but have it in your mind, be aware of it so that at the right point in that topic you can come back to it and you can um, revisit it and ensure that that knowledge is secure. So that's foundation. So secondly, I want to talk about sequencing. And this is an area of electrolysis teaching, which I've changed my mind about a lot. Um, and I'm going to kind of talk you through my current thinking and also just highlight where I would bring in some of that prior knowledge, which I've just been talking about. So um, I would start off in teaching electrolysis with not even mentioning electrolysis. I would talk about ionic compounds and conductivity and I would recap the, the structure of ionic compounds, um, the nature of ionic bonding, so the electrostatic attraction between the positive and negative ions. Um, I would recap the electrical conductivity, the properties of solid ionic compounds, of molten ionic compounds, of ionic compounds in solution. And I'd make sure that students really understand what a solution is um, and what's happened to the ions when we've gone from the ionic solid to the dissolved substance. Um, I think that's something from teaching that students are often not very clear on. Um, they often seem to think that if you've dissolved, say, sodium chloride, you've got sodium chloride units um, uh, dispersed throughout the water rather than sodium ion and chloride ions separately. Um, and so that's something that I would go back and, and make sure that that has been fully understood um, and revisited. Um, so I start off with that ionic compounds conductivity because that's crucial um, to our students understanding. Um, I'd probably also recap a bit of 
um, what we mean by electric current, that it's um, the, flow of the, the rate of flow of charge that we're talking about. Um, uh, and it, it will have an electric um, current when we have got charged particles which are able to move. So if you apply a potential difference in those circumstances, then a current will flow. So in a wire, we've got the free electrons. In the graphite electrodes, we've got the free electrons. When it comes to the solution, it's the ions that are moving. I think it's important that we talk about the fact that it doesn't have to be electrons, that it can be ions, and that it can be positive or negative ions um, that are moving. I think students are often fixated on electrons when it comes to um, electrical conductivity, and it's important that we expose them to um, examples where it's not electrons, but it's ions that are moving and um, uh, as that electric current. Um, so that would be just kind of ionic compounds and conductivity. Um, I'd then move on to a bit of an introduction to electrolysis um, in which I would talk about um, the etymology of the word electrolysis. And I'd give a bit of an introduction as to um, what electrolysis has been used for and what it's used for now as so to some of its applications. I might talk a bit about the history and how um, Humphrey Davy isolated several of the elements for the first time through using electrolysis. So it has an important place in the history of chemistry as well as being really important in various industrial processes um, kind of in the present day. So I try and set it a bit in context on, you know, why is this something that we're bothered about studying? Why is it something we're interested in? Um, as well as kind of what electrolysis means and what the process is. So the idea that we're going from the compound and we're breaking it apart into its separate elements. We're separating it out um, in that way. Um, then I would go on and start talking about electrolysis itself. Um, and the first thing I would talk about would be melts. And the reason I'd start with electrolysis of melts is because they're more straightforward, because if we are looking at lead bromide um, or potassium iodide as a, a, a molten substance, we've only got those two elements in that, in, in that electrolysis um, process. So the positive um, ion will go to the negative electrode, um, the negative ion will go to the positive, there's no choice um, in terms of what's going to happen at each of those electrodes, it's fairly straightforward. So I would talk first about electrolysis of melts, we'd look at some examples, we'd work through lots of questions about those, um, we'd look at the half equations, I'd get students to um, think about those ideas and um, to answer questions um, around electrolysis of melts. I'd then move on to solutions. And in terms of moving on to solutions, um, I would start with the rules for the discharge of ions at the anode and the cathode. I would not start with any specific example of electrolysis. Um, and the reason I'd start with the rules is because then all of the examples follow the same process in terms of thinking about them and working them out. I used to teach copper chloride electrolysis, um, copper chloride solution electrolysis, before I then started to talk about these rules, because I thought, well, copper chloride is a nice, simple example. Um, you know, we've got copper and chloride ions. They go to the relevant electrodes where they are discharged and it's straightforward. We haven't got to worry about the hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions from the water. But um, having taught this a few times, I found that students really struggle to then switch from the idea that well this is my copper chloride compound and I get copper and I get chlorine so when I do sodium chloride or copper sulfate I ought to get sodium and chlorine or copper and sulfate being produced and they struggled to kind of move away from the idea that what's in the compound that we're electrolyzing is what gets produced at the electrodes um, and so I have found it's much more effective and consistent and helps the students to kind of cope with the different examples if we talk about the rules first. So I talk about the rules um, for positive ions and linking that to the reactivity series. And that's why it's so important that they've learnt that right at the beginning. So if they don't already know the reactivity series, I give it to them to learn right at the start of the topic. Um, and I test them on it regularly, regardless of whether they think they've learned it before or not. Um, so they will all know the reactivity series and be ready to um, put that in, uh, apply that to um, the discharge of ions and deciding what happens at the positive, sorry, at the, the negative electrode with the positive ions at the cathode. Um, and I would then also give the rules for discharge at the anode with the negative ions and the fact that if you've got a halogen um, in there, if you've got the halide ions, then you'll get the halogen produced. If you haven't got the halide ion, you'll get um, oxygen produced. And we'll talk about the equations for those and 
uh, the fact where the hydrogen and the um, hydroxide ions are coming from, from the water. Um, and I would uh, teach those rules for discharge and I would give lots and lots and lots of practice. Um, so much practice of this because it's probably the thing that trips students up the most is forgetting to apply those rules in solutions. So we do lots and lots of practice of examples before looking at any actual electrolysis. Um, I would then teach through electrolysis of solutions looking at various examples. Um, so um, I'd probably start with copper chloride and then move through various other examples and I would uh, get students to think about which ions are going to be discharged at each of those electrodes, regardless of whether the hydrogen and the hydroxide are going to be involved or not. So I would always, with the solution, be going to think about what are your two positive ions in the solution? What are your two negative ions in the solution? Which ones are going to be discharged? Why? Um, and every single time we'll be going through that um, to keep embedding that knowledge. Um, the required practicals, um, there are required practicals in this topic around um solution electrolysis so i'd then get students to do those once they were kind of experts in electrolysis of solutions and finally i would talk about aluminium oxide electrolysis and i would leave that till last because it's different um it's not a melt um uh, exactly and it's not a solution in water um it's a bit different to all of them it's also got the industrial application which we can talk a bit more about um and so I leave aluminium oxide electrolysis till the end um, as a slightly different example um, at that point. Um, and in terms of prior knowledge and when I bring that in, um, I talk about half equations at the point of electrolysis of melts and again with electrolysis of solutions. We talk about atom and ion structure at those points, reminding students um, about how many electrons things have, how many they're losing and gaining when it comes to the oxidation and reduction um, in producing the halogen um, gases or um, hydrogen gas. I'd recap the fact that these are diatomic molecules. We might draw the covalent bonding diagrams um, just to recap those ideas at that point. Um, and we'd also be emphasising what state are these elements going to be in at these different stages because that's going to help students to link um, what they're observing uh, to what they know about what's being formed. So if they know hydrogen is being formed, they need to know that that's going to be a gas that they're expecting to see um, bubbles being produced. So that's kind of how I've sequenced my teaching of electrolysis. Um, so having thought about your prior knowledge, thought about the order you're going to teach it in, we then need to think a bit about the specifics of teaching these subjects. Um, and this is where I'm coming on to this idea of ways of seeing. Um, and really here, I'm um, referring to um, Johnston's triangle, which was uh, something that Johnston came up with as a way of thinking about the way we talk about things in chemistry and the way we represent things in chemistry, um, which I was really introduced to this through Nikki Kaiser's recent talk at Research at Norwich. Um, but I think it's really, really important um, actually in our teaching of all sorts of aspects of chemistry and it fits really nicely into this electrolysis topic. So um, the idea of this is that in chemistry as experts we are very adept at moving between the macroscopic, what we can observe, what we can see um, happening, the sub-microscopic, so what's actually taking place at a particle level within whatever it is that we're observing in chemistry, and the symbolic, how we represent that. If we see a half equation, we can read it, we understand what it means, we can see immediately um, what's going on and what that um, might imply. Um, when we see things happening on a macroscopic level, if we are looking at an electrolysis experiment and we see the bulb light up, we immediately can have some understanding of what that means is going on in that circuit, of what's going on in that solution. And um, if we see a gas being produced, um, we're able to link that to the fact that there's um, you know, two chlorine atoms that are coming together because the chloride ions have been attracted to the positive electrode and they've lost their electrons and they've joined together to form a chlorine molecule and that gas is being produced. We can understand that when we see these observations. Our students don't have that expert ability to make the links between these different ways of seeing things in chemistry. So 
the macroscopic, which we can actually see and observe, the submicroscopic, which is the kind of the conceptual understanding that as chemists we need to develop, and then the symbolic, which is our language or our ways of representing this um, so that we can communicate it to one another easily. Um, and I think these three levels of um, seeing things, these three levels in which we understand chemistry, um, really the being able to switch between those is one of the uh, kind of aspects of being an expert chemist. Um, and I think in my teaching before the last few months, I've drawn on all of these things. I've I've discussed the macroscopic, the submicroscopic, the symbolic, but I haven't really explicitly taught them to students before. I haven't really said to them, look, this is what we're observing. This is what it's um, is going on on the microscopic level. And this is how we represent it and kind of putting those in those categories to help students realise that that's what expert chemical thinking is about. Um, and I think that's a really powerful thing um, that we can do with students. And so having heard Nikki talk about this, um, back in June, um, I was teaching electrolysis to um, my year 10 class that I had in school and so I thought oh, I'm going to put this into practice, I'm going to see how, how it works in the classroom and, and, and see if I felt like it was a valuable thing to do. Um, and I have to say that I really did. So um, Nikki also shared this worksheet which she uses and which I've now used with my class as well, where um, having talked about a process, you can get students to actually think about, well, what is the macroscopic? What are we observing? What are the things that are going on on the macroscopic level? Um, what is the microscopic process that is kind of bringing about those things that we're then observing? And how do we communicate this as scientists um, in chemical symbols and using chemical language? Um, and so, this is an example that I filled in for the electrolysis of molten lead bromide. And I did really find that um, talking about this explicitly really did help students to grasp these different levels and to make the links between them. And also, I felt it helped them to transfer to new examples and um, kind of unfamiliar examples of electrolysis and that they were better able to transfer their knowledge across um, different examples than I'd seen in previous years. So this is something which I've introduced to my teaching recently and which I think I'm going to uh, take forward in electrolysis and other aspects of chemistry as well. I need to think about that some more. Um, so thank you to, to Nikki for bringing this to my attention and for designing this lovely sheet to use. Um, so um, having talked about kind of the importance of prior knowledge and thinking about prior knowledge, how I sequence electrolysis and this idea of different ways of seeing things in electrolysis, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about um, instruction and slop. So kind of what does all this look like in the classroom? Excuse me. Um, so in the classroom when teaching, and this applies to any topic, um, I tend to use a lot of direct instruction, so a lot of um, talking through information with students, usually under a visualiser, um, going through things, drawing a lot of diagrams, pictures to explain things. I ask lots of questions of my students. Um, they can't just sit there passively. Um, I need them to be engaged in discussing and answering questions. Using lots of concrete examples, um, so in electrolysis, that really involves me just having example after example after example after example of different electrolysis setups for them to um, discuss, think about, understand, talk through. Um, doing things in lots of small steps. So when I'm teaching electrolysis, I will give lots and lots of practice after each step. So we'll talk about one aspect of electrolysis and I'll give lots of, of, of questions. We'll talk about so we'll talk about melts, we'll do lots of questions about melts, we'll talk about the rules for discharge at positive electrodes, we'll do lots of questions about that, the rules for discharge at the negative electrode, we'll do lots of questions about that, um, solutions, we'll do lots of examples, lots of questions about that, bringing it all together. So it's step by step with lots and lots of practice in between each of those steps so that students are always secure in one bit of knowledge before they move on. I'd also be putting into that slop questions um, that draw out the prior knowledge. So I'd be putting in questions about electrostatics, I'd be putting in questions about different types of bonding, I'd be putting in questions about conductivity of melts, of solutions, 
like what is dissolving, uh, what happens to the ions in a solution, um, writing half equations, remembering state symbols and understanding those, um, oxidation and reduction, what are oxidation and reduction in terms of electrons and really drilling that home that it's not only about oxygen, we're also talking about electrons um, as another way of defining uh, oxidation and reduction reactions. So I would do a lot of these things. Um, so I just thought it might be helpful if I spent a few minutes kind of talking through how I might go about introducing um, one of these topics. So I'm just going to switch to my visualizer um, and talk through with you just for a few minutes, a very brief section of how I might introduce the electrolysis of copper chloride. So, um, if I'm talking about copper chloride electrolysis, I would start off um, by asking my students what ions I would expect to have in copper chloride. Um, and they should be able to tell me that we'd have Cu2 plus ions. Um, that's one they should have learned because it's a transition metal and it would be on the list of ions that I would have um, given them to learn previously. Um, and they should be able to tell me that they're Cl minus ions. They may just be able to tell me that they may need to think about Cl minus and I would talk through with them. I would be asking them questions. Well, what group is it in? How many electrons has it got? How many electrons would it need to gain? Um, therefore, it would be a Cl minus ion. I then discuss with them well, what would the formula of copper chloride be? How would you work that out? And they would need to think about the fact Well, this has got a two plus charge. This has got a minus one charge. Um, so we're going to need two of the Cl minuses for every Cl Cu2 plus. So our um, copper chloride would be CuCl2 and I would be recapping all those ideas from the bonding and atomic structure topic um, as we went through this and I do that for each example we come across in electrolysis because the more we can drill that knowledge the more students will remember it um, and I'd then be thinking about okay so what's the structure of copper chloride if we've got solid copper chloride I'd have crystals um, what, what would that be like in terms of the structure and we'd recap the idea of the ionic lattice I'd probably draw out or I'd have a diagram to show them of an ionic lattice so they could see that and then I say well would that be able to conduct electricity and what are the um, features that something needs to have to be able to conduct electricity the fact that it needs to have charged particles which copper chloride solid copper chloride does have that those particles need to be free to move in order to conduct electricity well they aren't free to move okay so how can we make them free to move how can we cause this to conduct electricity and we think about the fact that we could melt it the fact that we could dissolve it i'd make sure that they understood what the particle diagrams would look like for molten and for dissolved um, copper chloride and particularly for the dissolved state that they've got a good understanding that we've got those copper chloride ions spread out through that whole solution that it's the ions that have separated. It's not that we've got copper chloride units all separated out throughout that solution, but it's the actual ions are separated out. We've got copper ions, we've got chloride ions in that solution. Um, I'd also get them to remember from what we'd previously talked about that if we've got a solution in water, there's also H plus ions and OH minus ions. And we'd recap all of that before we even start talking about electrolysis. Um, I'd then get them um, to think about this diagram. I would not get them to write it, and I think this is important. I would want my students to be listening, to be uh, watching, to be taking in, to be answering questions, to be thinking. I don't want them worrying about writing at the same time. I can give them the diagrams later. Um, so in this diagram, what have I got present? Well, we're going to have Cu2 plus ions. We're going to have Cl minus ions. And I'll draw two of those because that's the ratio they'd come in. We're going to have some H plus ions. And we're going to have some OH minus ions from the water. And I just draw one of each of the ions that would be present or two if we've got that ratio. Um, and then I'd be asking my students, OK, so we've got this electrolysis set up. I turn on the power supply. What's going to happen? Um, I need to think about well, what's the power supply? The power supply, and I talk about it in electrolysis as an electron pump. So I say we've got electrons that are flowing in this direction. That means electrons are being taken away from this electrode. So what charge will it be? Well, that one will end up as being positive. And electrons are going to be pushed around to this side. They're going to be deposited on this electrode. So this one's going to be negative. So we've got a positive electrode and we've got a negative electrode. 
I'd introduce the names. If I'd already introduced them, I'd ask questions. What do we call these? Well, this one is the anode. And this one is the cathode. And I'd be getting my students to recall this information every time we come across it so that it's going in and going in and going in. Um, so that's the positive one and that's the negative electrode. So I'd then say, OK, so let's focus on the anode. What's going to happen to our ions in the solution? We've got a positive anode, we've got positive and negative ions. What's going to happen? And my students would be able to tell me whether well, the negative ions are going to be attracted to the anode. And I say, well, OK, we've got chloride ions and we've got hydroxide ions. Can you tell me which one is going to be discharged at the anode? And because we've already talked about this, we've already talked about these rules, they would be able to tell me that if we've got a halide ion present, those are the ones that are discharged at the anode. So these ones are attracted to the anode. The OH would also be attracted, um, but as they wouldn't be discharged, I probably wouldn't draw an arrow showing that. Um, and then what's going to be produced? Well, we know that we're going to have the chloride ions reacting. We're going to see bubbles being produced. And then we'd have the gas and it would be chlorine gas. And I'd say to my students, OK, so what formula does chlorine gas have? And I'd be expecting them to be able to recall from our previous topic on bonding that that's Cl2 gas. Um, and we'd think about well, what happens with the electrons. Um, and I'd be writing some notes along. So we'd probably write along the lines of Cl minus ions are attracted. They lose electrons. To become. Atoms. So we'd write well, we've got the Cl minus ions. They're going to become Cl atoms. Well, if they're losing electrons, I'm not only going to have a Cl atom left. What else am I going to have left? Well, there'd be an electron left over as well. And then if we know that this is Cl2, what does that tell me about how many Cl minuses, how many chloride ions I'm going to need? Well, we know it's going to be two. And then how many electrons would that mean were released? It would be two. So we get our balanced equation. Um, here we've got these losing electrons. So I'd relate that to the fact that this is going to be oxidation taking place because it's loss of electrons. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we'd be talking about our observations, our macroscopic level. We'd be talking about what's happening with particles, our submicroscopic level. We'd be talking about how we represent this with the equations. I would probably talk about state symbols. I think it's important that we remember those. Um, they're not often required in the exams for these equations, but I think it's valuable um, and important chemical knowledge for students to be practicing. Um, and so we'd talk through this. We'd go through it. We'd repeat for the cathode. Um, we'd we'd talk through that. Um, and I'd probably discuss with them, OK, well, we've done this in solution. Why have I chosen to use this as solution rather than talking about it as a melt? Why might that be the case if we wanted to electrolyze copper um, chloride? Why would we do it in solution rather than melting? And we talk about the energy requirements and how it's like easier to do it in solution, whereas something like lead bromide doesn't dissolve in water. So we don't have that option. Um, and drawing out all these various bits of knowledge they've had, focusing on the observations, the particle level and the symbolic representations. And then what I would do is having done this, I would actually get my students um, on their own to fill in one of these sheets. Um, and this is what I've done for the first time this year is to fill in one of these sheets where they draw and show the macroscopic observations. They then think about, well, OK, what's the particle level representation of that and a bit of explanation around that? And what are the symbolic representations? How do we communicate this chemically? What are the key terms that we're using to communicate and um, those equations that we're using to represent these processes? And I get my students to fill these in. We did one together and then on subsequent examples, I got them to do this as kind of independent work because I don't want them to just be copying what I've drawn. I want them to be thinking about this on a kind of more chemical level as to um, really understanding what is going on. Um, and I found that was really, really valuable. Um, and then when it came to answering questions, 
um, students seem to be able to um, draw on the right knowledge uh, more readily than they've been able to do when I hadn't added this kind of step into my teaching of um, electrolysis. So I think this three ways of seeing things is a really, a really valuable thing to include. Um, so in my classroom, my lessons in electrolysis are very much along these lines, drawing these diagrams, discussing um, lots and lots of questioning and dialogue um, to keep my students engaged, to keep them focused, um, to keep them thinking. And then um, summarising in these um, macroscopic, microscopic, um, etc. diagrams. And finally, doing lots and lots and lots of practice questions to consolidate their understanding. Um, so hopefully that just gives you a bit of a flavour of to kind of how I teach this in my classroom. So I'm just going back to my PowerPoint. I hope that you can see that again now. Um, and I'm just going to talk about one more aspect of teaching electrolysis, which is practical work. So um, practical work is, again, something I've changed my mind on a lot over the course of my career. Um, so I think initially I did a lot of practical, I did a lot of discovery learning through practicals. Um, I had a lot of time in my classroom where students were doing practicals without any real focus. It was, to be honest, they were playing with practical equipment. Um, and I've gone away from practicals to some extent. Um, but I think there is still a really, really valuable place for practical work in the science classroom. Um, and um, I love doing practical work, but it needs really careful thought, really careful planning. Um, and in electrolysis, um, I think the demo is massively powerful. Um, I really think there's a, a strong case for demoing most practical work in electrolysis. Um, um, it's so clear if you get a Petri dish, put it under a visualizer, you can really show electrolysis so clearly um, and have all the students seeing what they need to see. You can point out the key features which you just can't do running around the classroom trying to get to um, every individual workstation. So um, I would advocate demos. I think demos are really important um, for electrolysis. I think if we teach it without any demos, we're really doing our students a disservice. Um, it, they need to visualise, they need to see what's happening here. Um, just having it drawn on a piece of paper is not the same. Um, and so I would generally teach uh, electrolysis of melts, um, starting off with a demo. So I'd use that as the first thing I would do. And then once students have kind of seen, it's the first example I teach, they've seen it happen, they've seen the observations, we can then really talk about well, what was going on. Um, subsequently to that, I might do the demo at the beginning of talking about a particular example of electrolysis, I might do it at the end. So it might be, well, look, let's observe this, let's see, now let's understand. Or it might be, let's work out what's going to happen and now let's observe it because you know what you're looking for. And I think both of those have value and we should probably do a mixture of them throughout the, the course of uh, teaching electrolysis. But there is practical work. I think it's important that students do themselves. I think it's really important that they have had the experience of setting up the circuit of putting those electrodes into that solution and seeing that bulb light up, seeing the bubbles forming and um, seeing the metal depositing. I just think there's something wonderful about students being able to um, have that experience for themselves. Um, and they love it. Um, and so I think we need to make sure that that has a valuable uh, learning outcome from it. Um, and so the way that I tend to approach electrolysis practicals is to, at the very end of the topic, um, once we've taught melts, and once we've taught solution electrolysis, um, I would do the required practical. And um, the required practical, the way that um, I've done it, is to get students to do copper chloride electrolysis and sodium chloride electrolysis. Um, and the way I would work it is I'd get them to get all the equipment they need. Um, I'd get the solutions into the Petri dishes, make sure that was all sorted. Um, and then I would talk them through step by step setting up the circuits because the biggest faff with electrolysis is getting the circuit set up and the time that's wasted in that if you just get leave the class to get on with it is it's chaos. So I've employed um, Adam Ox's slow practical method that he's written about. Um, so the idea that I would talk the students through step by step, right, put this wire in to your, this terminal of your power supply, 
add a crocodile clip, add your electrode, the other side, do the same, put a bulb in, blah, 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 blah. We'd get it all set up. I'd get them all to check the circuits. I'd make sure they had spare wires so that if they need to switch and faff around with changing wires, I haven't got people running all over the classroom to do that. Um, so um, once they've all then got a circuit set up, which we know works, um, and I can just quickly troubleshoot if I know um, kind of exactly where everybody is and I know the circuits are set up correctly, it just makes it much easier to troubleshoot and fix any little errors. Um, at that point, I'd say, OK, now what your task is, is to put your electrodes into your copper chloride and on a diagram like the one that I'm showing you here on the, the PowerPoint, a really simple diagram. You've got your petri dish, you've got your positive electrode, you've got your negative electrode. And I'd make sure they'd set it up so it was that way round. So there was no confusion. Um, put your electrodes into your petri dish, write down your observations on that diagram. So if something's happened at the positive electrode, write down what it is. If something's happened at the negative, write down what it is. If something's happening in that solution, write down what it is. I'd then get them to do exactly the same for the sodium chloride. Um, in the sodium chloride example, we would have included indicator um, so they can see the changes of colour and the indicator that happened with that because that's kind of the interesting thing with that experiment. Um, so I'd get them to really focus on writing down observations. We might test for the gases if that was relevant um, and they could write down the observations for those tests for gases. That's another bit of prior knowledge which um, we could recap. Um, and then I would get the practical equipment packed away. So they're really focusing on let's do this practical, let's experience it hands on, have that have that moment of um, seeing that copper forming on that electrode and um, smelling that chlorine gas being produced. Um, and then I'd get them to pack it away. And once all that distraction is out of the way, we can then focus on, well, what did you observe? What what, what was happening? Um, and I then approached this from two different angles. So if I had a class that I felt were uh, going to cope with it, I would talk through the observations and just make sure they've all got the correct observations. Um, that's pretty reliable in these experiments normally. And then I would um, ask them to work through a series of questions. So I'd give them a series of questions, I'd get them to work through them. And those questions would be designed to uh, elicit the relevant information very carefully. So they'd be step by step, short answer questions, getting them to think through what those observations mean. And they should be able to do this because they're applying their knowledge of all the electrolysis examples which they've seen before, which would be lots. Um, so I'm not asking them to kind of discover anything. I'm asking them to apply the knowledge which they have got because I have taught it to them and because they have practiced it to be able to explain the observations from the practical. Um, if a class I didn't think would necessarily cope with that, um, maybe needed a bit more support, then it might be that we worked through those questions together or we discussed a bit more um, what was going on and then I got them to answer the questions um, having had a bit more um, support and a bit more modelling in those examples. Um, but I think the key thing is that the focus of the actual practical is let's get you all to have a go, let's focus on observations and then we'll think about the chemistry and I think that's something that's really important in all the practical work we do. What do we actually want students to get from that practical? Um, you know, do we want to focus on observations? Do we want to focus on getting some data? Do we want to focus on the analysis? In which case would it be better to give a demo have some data that we can collect really carefully together and then focus on that analysis. Um, so it's just a bit of food for thought with practical work. Um, so I hope that's been helpful. Um, I've talked for long enough, I think, um, but I just thought I'd bring up uh, again at the end these five key headings uh, just to remind you. So we've talked about the need for firm foundations, looking at prior knowledge and the importance of thinking about that in advance, sequencing, lots of debate to be had there but um, I think it's having that debate is the key and most important thing. Ways of seeing which I just think is so fundamental and a game changer in chemistry if we can really think about those three different ways of seeing and how they link together and get our students to think that way then they'll be thinking like chemists and that's that's really important. Um, instruction and slots so what do we actually do in the classroom so I've given you a bit of a flavour of how I go about teaching things I'm sure many of you do similar things already um, maybe some of you have other ideas that you'd be interested in sharing and practical work and the fact that I just think it's so important that we have the focus that we have a clear aim um, and that we structure practical work so that it's useful and students learn from it and it doesn't just become an exercise in um, playing with the equipment um, so I hope that's given you a bit of an insight into my thinking about electrolysis. I hope it's been interesting um, and I look forward to discussion 
um, on Twitter. Um, my um, Twitter handle is on the screen there. You can also tweet uh, to the Corksai Sci um, at Corksai Sci account. Um, and the link to this video will be on the Corksai Sci website um, forevermore. Um, and I will also provide some links to various different uh, resources, other talks I've re referenced and referred to, blogs, um, and a couple of the worksheets and things that I've mentioned. If there's anything else that I've talked about that you think it would be useful to have more information on, please let me know. So um, thank you very much. And if I can work out how to stop this video, I will do so. Okay, thank you very much and bye-bye.